Hello folks and welcome back to World War 2 TV and you are noticing that I'm not doing quite as many shows right now because I'm actually doing some of my day job as a tour guy which is quite nice. I will get back to doing more shows again but just May is a bit of a busy time traditionally in Normandy so I'm uh, making some hay while the sun shines. If you are new to the channel please don't forget to like what we're doing, consider becoming a patron or a member of the YouTube channel, share what we're doing on social media and as always all the links you'll need need are in the description below on youtube you have links to my guests books links to the social media uh pages links to how you can buy merchandise and get yourself a snazzy world war ii tv hoodie or t-shirt that's all there available but today this is one of those occasional shows i do during the course of the year where we pick up the 80th anniversary of something so 1942 was a busy year globally for the allies and today 80 years ago an invasion happened off the coast of Africa in Madagascar, which is a place that a lot of people probably don't even think about as having much of a connection with World War II. And that's what we're going to be talking about. So my guest, Russell Phillips, was previously on World War II TV talking about the connection between the Lidice massacre, you know, revenge massacre in Czechoslovakia in 1942 and the mining town in England. And now he's coming back on to talk about Madagascar. So I'll bring him in now. So good evening, Russell. How are you today? Good evening. I'm good, thanks. So Madagascar, as I said at the top of the show there, it's not in, you know, if you go into a pub in the New York or London or something, say name 10 places from World War II, Madagascar is unlikely to make anybody's top 10 places from World War II. So the, my question to you is kind of how did you first hear about it? And then and indeed, why, what prompted you to write the book? Well, I, um, my wife wrote this book um, and she, when she was first preparing it, she asked me for a, a small tank that looked like a stereotypical tank. And I suggested the Tetrarch. So looking for pictures and things of Tetrarchs, I, that was when I first came across Madagascar because they were used there. And I basically went down the rabbit hole. And the more I read about it and the more I learned, the more interested I got. And it just took off from there, really. Well, I mean, as it's as you know, that we will say in the description, it is interesting because it's not the enemy there wasn't the enemy we necessarily think of in terms of of the enemy that the Allies are facing in that middle period of the war, and it's, it brings in colonialism and the past histories and 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 even what happened in in that area beyond World War II. It had that an effect. A long-reaching effect, I suppose, really. So we are talking about the strange campaign, which is the attack on Madagascar. So Russell has come, as all my guests do, with a PowerPoint presentation, and I'll fire that up now. And so, as usual, folks, the link to the book, they are fast, yeah, graphic up on screen again there. So his book is called A Strange Campaign, The Battle of Madagascar. You can get it at all usual internet suppliers, or you can use the link I provide in the description below where I can make, or World War II TV, I should correctly say, makes a small commission. And Russell Phillips has his own website. You can contact him via there. He's on Twitter, and he's involved in publishing and writing and various things like that. So that's all that covered. So Basically, over to you, Russell, and those who are watching, if you have questions, uh, we'll we'll bring them up on screen as we go along, but I'm going to hand over to you, and we're specifically talking today, Russell, about kind of the first the first part of this campaign, because it, it was a, a quite a lengthy one for, for what was yeah. a kind of forgotten corner of the war. It did carry on some time, but I'll, I'll hand over to you to kind of give us a bit of context, and, uh, and um, viewers, sit back and enjoy. Okay, so um, Ironclad was the the code name for the first invasion. Um, just to give a bit of context, as you say, the, the whole island campaign lasted for about six months, um, but that was not originally the intention. The original intention was just ironclad. Um, as you say, it was it was a Vichy French colony um, at this point. <clears throat> so the when French um, when France rather surrendered and the British government took over um, the colony on Madagascar. There was a little bit of the governor in charge at the time um, was he didn't clearly state that he was um, for either for free France or Vichy France. Um, so he got replaced with a guy who was quite firmly um, loyal to Vichy. It was the first large-scale combined arms invasion by the Allies. Um, and at the time, it was pretty important. It was well known, you know, the newspapers all covered it and things. Um, and there's uh, there's video footage surviving now from Pate News and the like. But 
for whatever reason, we seem to have just, it seems to have been largely forgotten now. I guess it just got overtaken by bigger things later, doesn't it? I mean, it, yeah, it falls I, in a kind of a, in a gap between the early small scale kind of commando raids that we've covered on this channel. And then, of course, you get the much bigger kind of torch and husky and things like that, 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 that then kind of dwarf this in terms of scale. So it's sort of a, it's an in-between type size event, isn't yeah. it? It's not, it's much bigger than a commando raid, but it's not as big as a full-blown invasion of a continent. I suspect, to be honest, that Dieppe coming a few months later um, probably dominated the headlines at the time. And so, you know, and, and certainly um, now people know about Dieppe, even if they don't know about Madagascar. You know, it, yeah. And I suspect the, the closest in time has meant that Dieppe has kind of overshadowed it somewhat. Um, so if you go on to the, ne the next slide, um, the, the question has to be why. And uh, the Germans had plans for Madagascar um, before they started murdering Jews. The original, like, there were plans to just deport them all to Madagascar because, you know, get them from the, from the Nazi point of view, it gets them out of the way. You know, they're not a problem anymore. Um, but from Britain's point of view, that wasn't, yeah, you know, that didn't factor into their thinking. Their concern was that Japan would use it as a naval base because Diego Suarez, right at the north of the island, has a, a really big natural harbour. Um, and Churchill was worried about that even before the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbour. Um, so there was the, the concern if you had a naval force based there, you can see that any ships going around the Cape of Good Hope to head towards India or the Arabian Sea, they'd, they'd be right on the um, right in the way. And as we sorry, so they, as we found out last week with Gene Smith, fifty thousand Allied ships are estimated to have passed through the harbours in South Africa, including Durban. So, if you didn't see that show, folks, that was part of our Minorities Week. It will give you an idea of just how crucially important shipping is to to that side yeah. of Africa. Exactly. So the there were plans drawn up first in November 1941, which, as I say, was before Japan entered the war. But that all got got put off. Uh, that at that point it was called Operation Bonus, but it was roughly the same um, sort of plan. And then things moved ahead again in March 1942, when Admiral Rader um, reported that in in Germany, I should say, reported that the Japanese were planning to set up bases in Madagascar, and they Vichy wasn't allied with Japan as such, but they weren't really in a position to say no. You know, if, if Japan came along and said, we want to use Diego Suarez as a base, there was very little Vichy could realistically do about it. And Japan had already taken bases in French Indochina at this point. So those messages um, from Admiral Rader um, and between, sorry, messages between Germany and Japan were intercepted by the US and decoded. And that's how, that was the thing that really brought this forward. You know, at that point, the British started thinking, right, they're, they're actually planning to um, move on Madagascar. And so the on the 12th of March, the War Cabinet agreed to go ahead with this. That's when it got the um, code name ironclad. And as I say, the, the plan at that point was to just take the northern part of the island. There was no plan to take the whole thing. Um, and then in April, the Japanese mounted attacks on Ceylon, which also um, gave fuel to the, the argument. And there was, there was a belief that the Japanese had at least five battleships and five carriers in the Indian Ocean. So the, you know, they, the Allies thought there was a, a good-sized Japanese force that could stop doing this kind of thing. If we just move on again, um, the, sep the Special Operations Executive had agents on the island. Percy Meyer, pictured uh, with his wife Bertha, he was the, the head agent on the island. And Bertha um, worked on her own initiative and also um, operated the, the wireless for him. And they didn't the SOE on Madagascar didn't really do much in the way of sabotage. They were focused on intelligence gathering primarily. They did have a brief 
to try and encourage anti-vicious sentiment, to try and um, get the locals to back the free French rather than Vichy. But that didn't really succeed very well. Um, and just to give a mention, while Peirce was on a business trip in South Africa, Bertha sent some intelligence about a five merchant ships totaling 40,000 tonnes set in sail from Madagascar. And based on that intelligence, they were, the Allies were able to capture them. And that's that was seen as that was quite a um, a good win for the Allies at the time. But what they didn't realise was that when the Germans found out about this, they concluded that French security on the island couldn't be trusted. And because of that, they wouldn't allow Vichy France to send any more reinforcements to Madagascar. So uh, the Allies didn't realise it, but it effectively meant that Madagascar was on its own. There wouldn't be any, any help coming. So if you just move on, um, de Gaulle had argued for invading the island several times. Um, he was, <laughs> he seemed to believe that he had a lot of support on the island um, and that as soon as the free French turned up, the island would just, the islanders would just pluck to them. Um, that doesn't actually appear to have been the case by any stretch. Um, there was a lot of anti de Gaulle sentiment on the island, and most of the French on the island were actually uh, um, pro Vichy. Um, but they, the British didn't tell de Gaulle what they were planning. I didn't tell them anything about it at all because they had, there'd been problems with previous operations at, I believe it was Dakar, um, where the British had worked with the Free French and fairly or not, the, the British blamed the, the French for security lapses. And so for the planning for um, Madagascar, they just didn't tell them anything at all. They kept them completely in the dark. And for the US, they were determined that they weren't they wouldn't be involved um because they had good relations with Vichy France and they didn't want to spoil that. So it was very much a British operation. Um the the US did send ships to um reinforce the Royal Navy's home fleet so the ships from the home fleet could then move to Gibraltar, which meant that ships from the Gibraltar could then be involved in the Madagascar operation. But they wouldn't do anything directly. Right. So the 29th Independent Infantry Brigade and 5 Army Commando were assigned to the operation at first. Um, and the, the infantry sacrificed some of their motor transport to allow a, a composite armoured squadron to, to be added, which is made up of six Valentines and six Tetrarchs. Now, the, the Valentine in the picture is Valentine 2, but I've not been able to determine exactly what mark it was that was on Madagascar. It might have been a two. There was a all the descriptions I've found, um, I've narrowed it down to two marks. But the difference between them is so small I can't um can't work out which one it was. Um later the fifth infantry division's seventeenth brigade and the thirteenth brigade from the fifth division were both added to the operation. And both of those um, brigades were earmarked for India and they were going to be going to India. So they were basically um, added to the Madagascar operation for Ironclad as a sort as a as a reserve. And then once Ironclad was over, they would carry on into India. So the the land forces were commanded by Major General Sturges, who was a Royal Marine um, general. And the overall commander was Rear Admiral Sifra. And they sailed in March and April. So and while they were, they were sailing, Percy Meyer, who I mentioned earlier, got permission to try and bribe the senior French naval officer in Diego Suarez because he thought he might be able to bribe him into just um, surrendering and handing over Diego Suarez as soon as the Allies landed. And he went ahead with that. It didn't actually work. Um, <laughs> the French commander, a guy called Martin, turned him down, but he didn't report it. So Percy was able to carry on working um, 
even though Martin obviously knew that something was going on. And Percy did some incredible work. He got on board the, the French submarine um, Bisevia and had a uh, was shown around. And a sergeant gave him a guided tour of the defences at Courier Bay, which is where the landings were going to take place. Well, that's um, rather good. That's a bit of a bonus, yeah. isn't it? Yes, a guided tour. You know, we talk a lot on the channel about gathering intelligence ahead of invasions. Giving a guided tour by the you know, the, the defenders is is kind kind of a useful thing. Yes, and naturally, um, Bertha like sent all this back um, to the Allies over the wireless, and they kept on sending as the as the naval force was um, sailing towards the island. They kept sending updates about the, the forces and the political situation and so on. Um, and as, as a result of one of those updates, um, the Royal Navy realized that their charts were wrong um, in the Courier Bay area. Um, in particular, there was, a, there was an island that the, the chart showed in the wrong place um, and in just the right way that had it not been corrected, or if they hadn't noticed, it could have caused them some really serious problems. Um, so if you just move on to the next one, they, as I say, the, the British wouldn't allow the free French. Um, they just didn't tell them anything about this at all. And they were very concerned about security. They kept it really tight. The men involved were told that they were taking part in an exercise and they weren't told it was an actual operation until they were actually on the ship and at sea. And even at that point, they weren't told where they were going, just that they're going to invade somewhere. Um, the the naval force they'd they'd sailed from different ports, and they all came together in Durban in April, towards the end of April. Um, and South Africa broke off diplomatic relations with Bishop on the same day. And while they're in Durban, they set up a double bluff, so. They spread a rumour that the destination was Madagascar. But then they there were known enemy agents um, around and they allowed them to find out that that story was actually false and that actually they were going to Ceylon. And so they did things like um, conducting briefings about Ceylon and allowing people to see maps that apparently showed that the destination was still on and all this kind of thing. So <laughs> they left um, Durban on the 25th and the 28th of April, and they weren't actually given the final go ahead um, to, actually, to actually invade until the 1st of May. And at that point, the troops were finally told where they were going. And when they, um, the, the landings all took place on the western side of the island, um, which is where Korea Bay is. But there was a, a suitable landing site on the east, and HMS Hermione, which is pictured there, mounted a, a bombardment on the east coast um, and used star shells and um, set up a smoke screen and dropped smoke pots and things to give the impression that there was actually a force off the, the East Coast and that's where the invasion was happening. And they also, um, I, she also tried to engage coastal batteries there, but the coastal batteries could outrange her and so she had to, she had to withdraw. And Swordfish from the, the aircraft carriers dropped dummy paratroopers um, just near a police station. All of which, as I say, was designed to make the, the local forces think that they were being invaded from the east rather than the west. And the, in partnership with this, um, Percy Meyer had cut the telephone cables from the artillery batteries on the west coast so that they couldn't report in when the invasion happened. It did have some, um, it did work to at least some degree. The commander at Diego Sura Center um, a motorized reconnaissance unit out to investigate what was happening. And so on the next one, the, the landings actually took place on the 5th of May. Um, 
And uh, the SOE had got themselves a, a small boat, which they used to, um, they set up a, a light on it and used it to guide the ships in. Um, and the Percy Meyer, who had cut the, the cables for the, the shore batteries, he waited until about 20 to 3 in the morning and didn't see any indication of the of the, the landings because they'd been delayed. And at that point, he thought it had been called off, so he headed back to Diego Suarez. And he was caught with, he was caught by the police who had been tipped off. And he had notes on him um, about that he'd been taken, like while he was there, like, you know, he was making notes to um, give to the invading forces. And when he got caught, he tried to rip these up, but the, the police got them and were able to put them back together. Realised what he was doing and sentenced him to death. And the sentence was to be passed, to be carried out the next morning. Now, the, it's also worth noting that there was a, it was something of a, an ongoing um, attitude in the British side that they always seemed to think that they wouldn't face any real opposition from the French because, presumably because they'd been allies until mm -hmm. quite recently. There was always the feeling that actually once we land, you know, the, the French go, oh, fine, you know, we'll just stand aside, let you take over, which never came to pass. Um, but because of that, the the aircraft from the, the carriers um, were ordered to drop leaflets um, over Diego Suarez, which asked the people not to resist and for the, the French soldiers not to resist. And importantly, promised that after the war, the island would be returned to French control. Mm. Because that was always the the French always had a suspicion that this was about expanding the British Empire as much as anything else. Um, and de Gaulle also was always suspicious of the motives. And so they, these leaflets were trying to attempt to try and um, modify that. But they did also drop bombs. They didn't just, they, they dropped um, leaflets over Diego Suarez and bombed some of the ships in the harbour. And Governor Anna afterwards said that these leaflets might have been better received if they hadn't arrived just after a load of French sailors had been killed. Mm. Um, Admiral Sifret, for his part, said that they were useless and dangerous. And in his report, he used he said something like, um, the originators of the leaflets would be surprised what the recipients did with them, I think was how he phrased it. So the landings actually began at about 0430. And the artillery batteries were captured completely unmanned because the the French defenders didn't think it was possible to do a landing at night. And so they just, they didn't um, man the batteries at all. Um, they, as they took the, uh, the artillery pieces, they removed the breech blocks and threw them away so that if they got recaptured, they wouldn't be able to use them. But there was a, for the most part, the landings went really well. Um, there was a, one of the beaches had about 50 um, defenders who were Senegalese, but they knew about these because Percy Meyer had um, told them about them. So as the East Lancashire's landed on the beach, um, a company of the Royal Welsh Fusiliers had land, previously landed to the south and moved north to flank them. And so they didn't put up much uh, much opposition in the end. But there was a, um, a position called Windsor Castle that put up a, a really stubborn defence. Um, as I said, the, the landing started at about 0430. The Windsor Castle garrison appeared to surrender at about 0600. But when a, an officer went forward to take the surrender, he was shot and wounded. And they continued to... Um, to put up a defence for the rest of the day, and I think it was the next day by the time they, they finally gave in. Now, actually, upon the picture, this this photo was actually taken during an exercise rather than at Madagascar itself. Um, but that's the Bacacero, which was a, the first 
London ship tank to actually be used in action. And it was a, um, the, I think the concept originated with Churchill because he's, he saw a need for ships that could take tanks across oceans and then land on a beach. And so they, the first ones um, were converted merchant ships. And these ships were they're designed to operate. I can't quite remember where it is, but it's a place where there's a lot of sandbanks and things. So they had a particularly shallow draft. And that was this, the ironclad was the, the first operation where they were actually used. And it proved the, the concept, but also um, there were some issues. For instance, the, she had some issues with sandbanks, um, which, and so they, she couldn't get to the beach. So they ended up building a, a jetty um, to link from where Bakiko was able to get to, to the actual beach. And later on, she moved and the, the captain, um, her captain backed her off and went ahead at speed and basically charged through the sandbank to get onto the beach. And this is, as I said, they, having um, it proved the concept, but also showed some of the issues that could happen. And so later LSCs always had um, carried causeways on board that they could, so they could build a, um, mm. <clears throat> the causeway onto the, the beach if they couldn't get there. And worth jumping in here, Russell, just to echo what David O'Keefe said about the, the, the lessons to be learned from this, because David, of course, author a book of a book about Dieppe, uh, Dieppe is often cited as one of the major lesson learning events prior to, for example, Overlord and Torch. But mm -hmm. from what you're saying here, and just recapping, uh, dummy paratroopers, deception campaign, bombing areas you're not doing, going to land so that you can keep the landings where you are going to land secret, the development of LCTs or LSTs, because that's Stephen Fisher's point, that when we talk about the importance of the landing craft for D-Day, it's not really the small LCA, LCVP type landing craft that was essential. It was more the bringing in of the vehicles in the larger vessels. So already, and we are only halfway through the presentation, we're seeing some clear um, introduction of things that would become standard as operations go on later on. So I think already we're kind of learning that if we want to look back to a 1942 operation that influences big landings later on we're looking we should be looking in africa not on the north coast of france in dieppe i i i don't know enough about dieppe to to be able to say that you know no lessons were learned or anything like that but i certainly think that lessons were learned at madagascar and yeah. it's i think it's a real shame that that's been forgotten i you know yeah. it, so if you move on to the next slide yep the five commando um, headed for Cap Diego, which is a um, to the northwest of Diego Suarez, and the the others started heading towards um, Diego Suarez. Now it was five five army. It was army commando rather than the Royal Marine commandos. Um, they didn't have much opposition on the way to Camp Diego. They did meet some prepared positions, which included a couple of um, artillery pieces round about um, half past 12. And there was a brief fight, um, but they didn't lose any um, anybody. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the French lost an officer and 12 men. And then after that, they encountered some sniper fire but got to Cap Diego about half past two in the afternoon and had captured it after about half an hour. So while they were doing that, the Royal Welsh Fusiliers marched to Diego Suarez. Um, their transport was still on the ship, hadn't got offloaded yet, so they were marching on foot. But there were some universal carriers and motorbikes that took the lead. And while they were doing that, the Royal Scots Fusiliers headed further south to capture an airfield. And while they were doing this, um, aircraft from the aircraft carriers bombed the harbour, local airfields and artillery batteries. And as I mentioned earlier, they also dropped leaflets on Diego Suarez itself again. Um, about 8.15 in the morning, 
one of the, the universal carriers captured a, a French naval officer um, named Capitaine Ivana, I think. Apologies, my French pronunciations might be awful. Um, and some ratings. And again, as I say, the, the British had this, this belief that um, the French wouldn't necessarily put up any resistance. And so they allowed Evenet to go back to Diego Suarez with a letter for the, the colonel in charge. <clears throat> because again, they, they thought they could persuade them to just not, um, not put up any opposition. The letter was completely ignored. Um, but even that was able to to give the defenders some idea of what sort of force was attacking. Which meant that a company of light infantry took up positions at Calderbon Nouvelle, which is you can see on the map. Um, and three companies took up positions on the Shoffre line, which is a set of defences south of Diego Suez, which we'll get to later. So the, the British arrived at Calderbon Nouvelle, where this company was, um, round about quarter past 11, and seeing that there was um, going to be some resistance, they called on the Scots Fusiliers to start heading north to, to help out. There, <clears throat> there were two, three tanks um, available to help, <clears throat> two Valentines and a Tetrarch, but they couldn't elevate their guns high enough to, to actually engage the defenders. Um, but there was a, a light battery of all artillery who were able to shell the positions, which just made the defenders move back um, beyond the, the ridge so that they, they couldn't be seen. They eventually took the hill um, with a bayonet charge about three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and they, it was at this point, I think, where the British started to realise that this was actually going to be a serious fight because about, there were quite a few of the defenders were killed and almost all the prisoners they took were wounded. You know, they'd put up a serious defence. Um, so they hadn't just surrendered as soon as they got an option. You know, they, they really fought hard. And they... The Royal Scots Fusiliers took over the advance at this point because the, the Welsh Fusiliers had been involved in the fight. So the Royal Scots Fusiliers started advancing on to Diego Suarez while the Welsh Fusiliers rested and then followed on. And at this point, the, the tanks went on ahead because the British at this point still had the, the attitude that tanks could operate completely alone. They didn't need infantry. Um, the armoured charge was still part of the training drills. And uh, if you just um, move on to the next slide, the, the Valentines, being infantry tanks and being really heavily armoured, the British thought there was nothing on the island on the French side that could penetrate the Valentines' armour. So the, the Valentine crews thought they were impervious, and they so they took the lead. And they... The British didn't know about the Joffre line at this point. They had maps um, and the, the line was marked on the maps with the French word ouvrage, which I believe means work. And in the context, it meant defensive works, but the British had misinterpreted it to mean works as in like a factory or, or something like that. Mm. Mm. Um, so the, the Valentines were charging ahead. Um, and they kept, and then the seventy-five mil guns from the from the um, the Joffre line fired, and the Valentines kept going, thinking that they were invulnerable. And they quickly discovered they weren't. the The driver of the lead tank was killed, and the turret was jammed. And then, as the gunner and the commander bailed out, the gunner got the gunner was wounded. And then the second Valentine, its turret also got jammed, and its gears were damaged. Gears were damaged. And as they as they bailed out, the driver was killed because the the tank kept going and it rolled over him. Some of the um, there were three tetrarchs with them at this point, and two of those were hit. 
the third one stopped in dead ground um so it couldn't be engaged and they 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 were ordered to um head back to the brigade headquarters to report on what was happening on their way back they encountered a lorry load of infantry um which they destroyed and took the they destroyed the lorry and took the, the prisoners infantry and the the tank crews um hid in long grass um and a, one of the gunners a guy named sergeant grime um made several journeys to collect weapons water first aid and things from the tanks and was awarded the distinguished conduct medal and the citation said that he was consistently cheerful and determined and behaved with the utmost contempt of danger and i hid in the the long grass they managed to beat off two infantry attacks which given that these are just tank crew you know without their tanks is is quite is pretty impressive um and they were finally captured at about quarter to four in the afternoon um the officer in charge was was fatally wounded in a hand-to-hand -hand fight and it's the the i believe it was saying gleason infantry were were looking like they were going to kill the the rest of the british tankers but a, a french officer intervened and insisted that they they take them prisoner if you move on we've got another picture of um joffre line casemates how they are now so a little about two hours after that um the infantry arrived with four valentines and three tetrarchs um and again the tanks tried a head-on charge this time with um infantry and support they were hope the hope was that they could take the gunners by surprise but sergeant clegg who was commanding a tetrarch called it a rerun of balaclava two of the valentines were hit um two of the men two men were killed a driver was wounded and when his commander um captain a guy called captain palmer went back for him they were both hit by a high explosive shell which killed them both and palmer was recommended for the victoria cross for that he actually got a military cross so the remaining two valentines and three tetrarchs kept firing until it got dark but the you know the attack was was over at that point and at this point brigadier festing started to plan for a night attack because he you know it was obviously they weren't there <clears throat> so the british then started to try to think a bit more imaginative not just like head on charge they they made a plan that the south lancashires would go around the east flank of the the joffre line and attack from the rear as the raw scots fusiliers and the east lancashires attacked from the front from the south and the support would be provided by 3.7 inch howitzers and um swordfish and albacores from the aircraft carriers were going to bomb the, the defences before the attack. <clears throat> so the the South Lancashire's um, got started and they head, headed off um, in the early hours of the morning. If you move on to the next, um, but with it being it was very dark and they found they're going very slow and they they couldn't get they really struggled to keep cohesion which meant they didn't get to their, their planned start line in time. Also, the, the, air, attacks, the air attacks started at 0500 as, as planned, but the positions were well camouflaged and the pilots had real trouble finding, finding their targets. The frontal attack started, I'm oh, sorry, no, no the, the South Lancashire's taking the flank at 05.30, um, they were due to start their attack. They weren't at their planned start point, but they they split off into section-sized groups with orders to just cause as much trouble and as much damage as they could. 
which they did. And they carried on doing this all day. They And they did quite successfully. They took prisoners. They captured the radio transmission um, station. They stampeded pack animals that the French were using to move their, their artillery pieces. But they weren't able to contact the brigade headquarters to tell them what was going on. So um, Brigadier Festing had no idea that all this was happening behind the lines. Also, Five Commando, who worked Cap Diego, were supposed to cross over the water um, to help with the attack from, from the rear. And there's some con they didn't, and there's some um, controversy about why. An SOE officer who was with them said that they couldn't find any boats to cross. But units in Five Commando said that late, later that boats were found, but the commanding officer wouldn't issue the orders. And he said he was a, an alcoholic. And because he hadn't been able to drink, he couldn't bring himself to make a decision because he was too sober. So I'm, I'm honestly not sure what happened there. Like I said, there's, there's the two stories. I mean, it seems um, to me, I'll just interrupt you and give you a, a, a breather for a second or two. It's, there's, a, there's a combined operations streamlining that has not yet been achieved. I mean, in terms of forward observers and communications and, you know, into, into, into you know, radio contact and things like that, that, that we, we, we were better at as the war went on. And you can, you can see in this situation the slight shortcomings in communication between tanks, infantry, the naval support that's not too far away, the commandos there. And it's, you know, the ingredients are in place. If we talk about lessons, the ingredients are in place for future success. But as you said yourself with the, with the LSDs, there's there's teething problems that you can then yeah. think, hang on, th th there's, a, there's a clear problem here that needs to be addressed for future operations. Yeah, I think it, it shows that this is the first time, you know, it, yeah. that's what it comes down to. Um, so, yeah, the five commando um, on Camp Diego actually found that the, there was a, a French sloop um, in the harbour which shelled um, five commando in, in Camp Diego and actually landed some Marines um, and the French were able to retake some ground from, from five commando. So the, as I say, Brigadier Festing didn't know um, that the South Lancashire's were actually doing quite well behind the French lines. Um, and the frontal attack didn't do very well. Um, there, was a, there was an anti-tank ditch ahead of the, um, the casemates and defensive positions. And some of the attackers got trapped in there. Uh, most of them managed to get back up through the day. But it was all starting to look a bit from, well, from Brigadier Festing's point of view anyway, it was all starting to look like it was going wrong. Because um, I say, he didn't know what was happening with the South Lancashire's behind the lines. And Bertha Meyer, who was in the fishy controlled section of the island at the time, had sent um, radio messages saying that troops were being formed up and ready to move north. So they were they were very keen to um take Diego Suez quickly before these French troops arrived in their rear. And they, you know, they at that point they would have ended up sandwiched between the two. So they carried on um harassing the defenders and planned to mount another attack at eight o'clock that evening using seventeenth Brigade, which were fresh. And Sturgis, who was the overall commander of the land forces, um, went back to the beach and went out to Remilles, Remilles where Admiral Sifrit was, to ask for some. Um, he actually asked for about 20 or 30 sailors to be landed at, on the Diego Suarez Peninsula, um, right behind the French lines. And Sifrek told him he could have 50 Royal Marines, but they would have to put the start time back to half past eight. So obviously, you know, he, he accepted that. Um, and the, if you, I see, don't move on just yet. So the, the 50 Royal Marines that Sturges had promised, um, sorry, Sifrek had promised, came from HMS Remilies, um, which is a, a battleship and was um, 
women at Sifret's flagship. But they were moved to HMS Antony, which is a destroyer, but they um, moved to Diego Suarez. If you move on to the next slide, the, the little ship in red represents Antony, which is what they'd moved to, and the big ship in black is Ramilies. And it's just a, it's an illustration of the difference in displacement because the Marines got seasickness once they, or they all got seasick once they moved on to Antony. When I first read this, I was thought, like, you know, but they're Marines, they live on board ship, you know, surely they're used to this kind of thing. But then I realized that they, they were used to life on board a battleship, which is a huge ship, which, you know, won't move a great deal. And you move on to a destroyer, which by comparison is tiny and is going to move a lot more with the waves and so on. So it was, it was basically seen as something of a suicide mission. Sifra expected them to lose 30 of the 50 men and he expected Antony to be sunk. And they were, the plan had always been that this campaign, this um, this operation to take the north of the, the island would be a quick one. And they were starting to think that actually it was going to turn into a long drawn out thing. Um, but about this time, things started to um, look better under the land position as well. The commanding officer of the South Lancashire's who were operating behind the French lines, managed to get a message back to the British to let them know what they'd what they'd done. And there were signs that the French were, their resolve was starting to weaken. But the, the Marines on Antony went ahead with their, with their plan. So if you move on to the next slide, about quarter to eight, Antony started her approach to the bay and the cruisers Hermione and Devonshire provided her with cover. It was very dark at this point um, and Antony steamed in at 22 knots. She got spotted by a searchlight and the shore batteries, you can see um, there are several shore batteries on the, the mouth of the bay, um, open fire on her. But between the three ships, um, the shell fire put the light out and Antony managed to get to the um, to Diego Suarez, overshot the jetty where she'd planned to um, drop off the Marines. So she had to um, back up and the Marines then, like she reversed onto the jetties and the Marines had to climb over the, the depth charge launchers to actually get off the ship. As all this was happening, a French gun crew had manhandled the 75 millimeter gun onto the jetty and they managed to get off a single shot at Antony before she shot out of the bay again and they missed and it was literally point blank range but for whatever reason they missed and they didn't get a chance for a second shot because by then the marines were all over them wow. and Antony shot back out of the bay and didn't get a scratch <laughs> as I say I'm Admiral um, Sifra was expecting to lose Antony and she got out of it absolutely fine. Um, so the Marines, they took that 75mm gun, then they um, found and captured the artillery commander's house and they found 50 um, captured British and enough, they found enough um, French weapons that they were able to arm these 50 prisoners. So at that point, there were a hundred of them and they, um, they moved to Diego Suarez, um, and they, um, the captain price who was in charge of the, the Royal Marines and Lieutenant commander, John Hodges, who was the skipper of HMS Anthony were both awarded the distinguished service order. And you remember I said, it was thought it was something of a suicide mission and um, Sifra yeah. expected 30 of the Marines to be lost. They only suffered one Marine was wounded and the reports <laughs> said that he was wounded in a rude but unimportant part of his anatomy, which I imagine means he was shot in the bum, but I don't... Yeah, I don't yeah. Know. I, I think it is quite important. I sit on, I use mine a lot as a <laughs> sitting device, but anyway, yeah, that's interesting, but yeah. 
you, you were just minutes ago talking about a perceived suicide mission, and we end up getting a ship that survives, a large, a, a, for, a force doubling because of prisoners, and only one guy wounded in the ass. Yeah. It's um, it's it's battles can change very quickly. Yes. <laughs> so while all this was going on, of course, the um, the British were attacking the Joffre line from the front, and that it succeeded, but it was a it was a hard fight. Um, they ended up taking it with bayonet charges. And by three o'clock in the morning, Diego Suarez was completely in, in British hands. And at that point, um, SOE officers who were attached to the brigade headquarters discovered that Percy Meyer had been sentenced to death. But they managed to find him, he was still alive. They, as I say, he'd been sentenced to death um, and he was due to be killed that morning, but the authorities had been so busy dealing with the attack that they hadn't taken it, actually um, acted on the, the sentence. So he survived. So at this point, um, the British have Diego Suarez, but they still can't actually use the bay because the um, the shore batteries on the, the peninsula are still in action and they were a serious threat to anybody entering. Um, if you move on, the, that night, um, the French submarine, the Heroes, I think is how you pronounce it, um, it had been on, I think it had been um, escorting a, a merchant convoy and it returned. It was sunk by um swordfish from illustrious and the corvette hms canister and at dawn three moran saulnier 406 got into a dogfight with a bunch of british martlets all three of the french aircraft were shot down and one martlet was lost the joffrey line forts at this point were still manned but they weren't considered too much of an issue because they were they were isolated um, and could be largely ignored. But say the shore batteries on the peninsula were were a serious problem. Um, and they were, the maps that the British had captured showed that they were defended against land attack. And General Sturgis estimated it would take several days, um, probably about 300 casualties to take the, the forts. He sent a message to Admiral Sifret in the early hours of the 7th of May, asking for naval and air support for an attack that morning at 9 a.m. That was put off until 10 a.m. with the land attack to start at 12. Um, but the SOE agents um, who were attached to the, his headquarters talked to Percy Meyer about this and suggested that they should try and negotiate a surrender because they thought that, that might be feasible. So Sturgis agreed and sent a message to Admiral Sifra at 10 to 10, which is like 10 minutes before the bombardment was due to start, asking for a 30 minute delay. The negotiations went well. And, and so he, uh, another signal was sent at 10 past 10, asking for a delay until further notice. But Sifret wasn't happy at this point. Um, he later wrote, I was tired of this shilly shallying and parleying for which I had given no authorization, bear in mind that he was the overall commander, um, and which was keeping the fleet steaming up and down in dangerous waters. And so he replied that he was going to commence a 15 minute bombardment to encourage the, the French to surrender, um, which started at 10.40 and a the batteries raised the white waste white flags pretty much straight away. And it stopped at after ten minutes rather than fifteen, and they the surrender was taken without any casualties at the end. Um, and by three p.m. on the the seventh, the Joffre line forts had surrendered as well. At that point, the the North Island was in British hands. So the the minesweepers then moved into sweeper channel into the bay 
and ships, the ships of the fleet started um, moving in. Some of the ships um, stayed at Courier Bay for a while and didn't come until the next day. And at the on the eighth, at about eight a.m., a French submarine, the Monge, fired torpedoes at the at HMS Indomitable. But this was while she was outside the bay. Um, the, the torpedo channels were spotted, and she was able to evade them. And Monge was sunk by HMS Active with depth charges. Indomitable and her escort stayed outside the bay until the 9th to provide anti-submarine and fight cover. And if you move on to the next slide, Admiral Sifret accepted the, the formal surrender um, on the 8th of May on HMS Ramillies. And on the 9th, Churchill sent congratulations to Sifret and Sturgis. And he also sent a, an extra message to the 29th Brigade because he'd seen them training in Scotland some months prior. Mm. Um, and he sent them a, a personal message. Um, the, the SRE agents on the island recommended that the British should occupy the entire island because otherwise they, it was going to... Churchill said um, in a couple of different messages that it was supposed to be a help and not burden. And the SOE agents basically said, yeah, if you don't take the whole island, it will be a burden because you'll have to supply it. Whereas if you've got the whole island, it's reasonably self-sufficient. But if you just got the north, it's not. And, you know, you will then have to supply it. Um, but the, the British were keen to um, to get the units elsewhere and either two of the brigades that were involved were were intended for India and were, you know, were just there as a reserve. So Sifriot was ordered to make Diego Suarez secure with the smallest forces he could. He expected and hoped that the French on the southern part of the island would just adopt a, what he called a live and let live policy. Yep. Um, he was happy to, to do the same. But French attitudes, again, were really hardened against the British um, and they the, there was there's no indication that the French had any intention of attacking the British and trying to um, take the North back but equally they um, they were determined that if the British decided to take the rest of the island they would fight as hard as they could and make them make them pay for it Anthony Eden, the Foreign Secretary, met with de Gaulle um, because the first de Gaulle heard about the invasion was when uh, a journalist rang him up and asked him for his <laughs> what he thought about it. For his quote, yeah, yeah. What do you think, <laughs> General Sir? Yeah. So de Gaulle was really, really unhappy, um, partly because he hadn't been told, but also, as I say, he, he was suspicious of British motives. You know, he, he saw it as a, a British attempt to expand the empire. Um, and he, Eden um, told him that the French hadn't been invited to take part because it was felt to be undesirable that Frenchmen should fight against Frenchmen. And de Gaulle replied that he he understood that, you know, you didn't always consult with your allies and said that he might himself one day undertake an operation without consulting anybody. And later in 1942, in, in November, the Free French did um, take Reunion, which is an island just yeah. not far from Madagascar. So that was, um, I'll just close by saying the British casualties were 109 killed or missing and 284 wounded. They lost nine aircraft with five damaged and only one ship lost, which was a minesweeper off Courier Bay. The French lost 145 killed, 336 wounded, 17 aircraft were destroyed, and they lost two ships and three submarines. 
and it was yeah i the british did ultimately um realize that they needed to take the rest of the island and and did do that later but at this point they were the policy was to just hold the north and as i say church was keen to um that it shouldn't be a burden which didn't actually work out really. <laughs> yeah no indeed well i mean brilliant russell so i mean my two my two takeaways are we and people watching this are already making these connections with as i say torch and overlord and things like that and of course there are people better than me david o'keefe watching who would who would know whether or not operation ironclad ever does come up in the planning meetings and things like that all the people who are discussing things in whitehall they would say yes it comes up frequently or no it never comes up but mm. so it seems there are connections to be made but whether they were actually made or not i don't know it all depends on whether any officers involved in this were ever in a position to better share their wisdom with anybody who was planning anything later on but we, we can clearly see things the other interesting thing is obviously the interesting relationship between britain france the usa michael nyberg talked about that on the channel the last year and you know and it's that era again 42 is a bit complicated we everyone knows what the situation was in 1940 and by 1944 45 it gets a bit clearer but that middle part of the war with the french colonies things like that it is a, a little bit less clear exactly what people's motivations are and what their aspirations are because the, the fact that you've mentioned a couple of times the idea of it's not just madagascar's immediate wartime situation it's well what, what will its situation be post-war so that we yeah. know that churchill is thinking about you know the, the the soviet advance after world war ii but for the people of madagascar they've got they're thinking of their immediate situation their situation as it had been up to world war ii and more importantly maybe for them what their situation was going to be after world war ii so a lot of things to um a lot of ideas to spin around there and, and so with, with your with your book we'll bring things to end with that but how how easy or difficult was it to research because it's clearly not the kind of subject you can go to a library and get the 10 previous books on and read all them because it hasn't really been discussed very much so what of, of the things you've written about was it sort of difficult or easy it was um there are to be fair i have to say there are other books um that mention it you know there's um usually it's uh england's last war against france is one right, um yeah. which is very much a um madagascar is is part of the story of that book you know but it it covers a lot more as well um and traditional enemies is another one and again you know it's um it's not just about madagascar but it does it gives you a starting point um yeah and there's you know there's loads of material in the archives and what have you um but it was and also i was i have to say um i um i've spoken to or emailed with the the son of um percy and bertha meyer which is really quite fascinating and mm. and also um because the later on in the campaign um she was still in the the Bisha held part of the island um and she was still working out she was still like sending off reports and things despite the fact that her husband and her superiors at SOE had both told her to stop, she carried on. And the authorities knew there was a wireless operating and they had um, radio direction finding units and they did things like when she was transmitting, they would cut off the power in a certain part of the city to see if like, if the, if the radio stopped transmitting, then obviously she was in that part of the city and this kind of thing. And they actually searched her house at one point and still didn't find the radio and she was like she had small kids like you know she had babies um and you know she's like dealing with them and doing all this it's just so yeah i mean um being able to to talk to them was was really interesting and um there was a as a um a guy who's i can't remember who's south african not but he's just like doing internet so i came across this um thing that was written by a guy i think it was on it was on some kind of foul sharing site like i don't think it was on script but it was that kind of thing 
Um, and it was, I think it, that was largely based on his father's um, experiences in the campaign and what have you. And, you know, you can, if you look, there are, you can find odd little nuggets of information like that. And that kind of thing can, can get you, um, and you, I'm, I'm a bit wary of trusting like, you know, some random document I find on the internet, but it can give you a, a starting point to go looking for. Yeah, it gives you a clue as to where to look and, next. It gives yeah, you, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I, I, as I always say, I try and do a little bit of research before I do these shows. So I got some volumes. I thought, I wonder if Madagascar gets a mention in that. And you look at some of these big sort of four, 500 page books and it comes up in the index twice, you know, the little <laughs> fleeting mentions of the harbor or fleeting mentions of the illustrious or something like that there, but it doesn't really get expanded on. Um, the one question I'm going to do one question for you from Ian Carr and it is, did the allies make much use of the harbor eventually? Not really. No. Um, and uh, once they'd taken the Island, the, well, no, actually, I, I'll change my answer slightly. Um, I don't believe it was used um, a great deal as a, a base for offensive warships. But once the island was was taken completely, um, it's quite an important source of various raw materials that are mm. important in wartime. And so there was a lot of shipping for that kind of thing. And notably... And it's the sort of thing you would never like you would never dream of necessarily um it's it's a source of high quality graphite which was really important for the um the atomic weapons program random so, yeah, yeah yeah no that's good like, i thought you were going to say within. pencils but no you said that you, I, I thought is he going to say pencils and you went <laughs> atomic so you went very other end of the scale i was thinking for then but yeah no, it's fascinating. Um, I think again, although the, the harbor palace it's... wasn't used, we it was denying it to the enemy. You know, you going right back to the beginning, yeah. the Japanese aspirations. So sometimes, even if you don't want to use it yourself fully, you're stopping someone else use it for their purposes. So that is something else, I think. So, well, I think we'll bring things around there. And people have been saying that it's been fantastic and interesting. And good. And someone said lemurs is the other thing, <laughs> <laughs> the exportation of lemurs. <laughs> To, to the zoological societies of the world. Yes, thank you for that, Ian. And we should just acknowledge Derek Younger, who's joined us today, whose father was there in Number 5 Commando. So that's one of the wonderful things about this channel is people discover it, and then you find a new viewer who has a connect. We know Darren, Darren Little is always watching, and his family were always involved in every operation in World War II. We know that. Thank you very much, Darren. But it's also good to bring someone else in there, and that's the wonderful thing about making these connections. So I hope... I hope it's one of those um, campaigns that continues to be studied because I think there are some lessons we can learn from it. You know, and and you know the, the the fact that I'm sure there's people who are watching this who can now drop into casual conversations when the when the dummy paratroopers of Normandy come up, they can say in that voice, actually they were using Madagascar two years earlier. So that's one of those little pub things people can do, and that's what it's all about. There was a thing on Twitter a yeah. couple of days ago. What's the most obscure fact from World War Two? You know, and there's. There's one that replica, replica paratroopers used at, Mad used at Madagascar. So, well, brilliant. Thanks for joining us, Russell. I'll just um, remind people what we're coming up tomorrow. So, folks, we have a show tomorrow evening. Uh, Andrew White is coming on to talk about an Olympian and RAF Spitfire pilot, Donald Finley. That'll be really good. And then I'm hoping to do the LRDG show on the 9th and then gradually fill some more things in there. It is a tricky time of year to get guests, folks, because academia, it's marking season, it's submission season. So I'm doing two weeks, hopefully, about show shows from the German point of view. But the June one is filling up much easier than the May one because everybody's really busy. So if I'm a little bit thin on the ground in shows in this month, it's because guests have got other commitments. So but don't worry, we will be continuing with lots and lots of shows as the season goes on. But I'll bring Russell back in to say goodbye. And of course, remind people the links to purchasing the book there. Have you got a copy you can hold up there for us? Have you got one? Um, I have just here. There, there go. we go. It's there and the <laughs> links there. So it's strange campaign about Madagascar in World War Two. So there we are. So thank you, everybody. This is Paul Woodhead for World War Two TV saying I'll see you all again tomorrow night at 7 p.m. GMT to talk about Donald Finley, RAF Spitfire pilot and Olympian. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for your Cheers, attention. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.